Prosperity is more than a number. It's the power to shape what's possible for you, your family, and your heirs. Here, you'll find ideas for building wealth, safeguarding it, and translating it into true prosperity with insight from actual business owners and financial professionals. Welcome to the FDP Prosperity Report, hosted by your Chief Prosperity Officer, Mark Chandick. Welcome to another episode of the FDP Prosperity Report. I'm your host, Mark Chandick. Today we're looking at exit strategies for business owners. Your business is not simply what you do with your time and talent, it's a sizable asset. We're going to help you think about what's next for both your business and yourself, even if you never plan on retiring. I'm joined by my fellow FDP team member and newest partner, Ben Julianel, who heads up our Navigators group. They focus on succession planning and exit strategies. Welcome, Ben. Glad you're here. Thanks for having me, Mark. Glad to be here. So before we talk about specific strategies, one of the questions that business owners often wonder is, how much is my business worth? How do you answer that? Well, we get asked that question all the time. And um, I think it really depends on who the buyer is. Is it a strategic buyer? Is it an insider? Is it a competitor? Um, is it a private equity group? But really, the better question for us as planners is, what do you want it to be worth? What does it need to be worth so you can have your happily ever after? That's a great answer to a very important question. I think that uh, it might make sense to talk about the four basic stages that a business owner goes through when they want to transfer their business. First, assembling a team of professionals that will help with the process and bring their own unique talents to the process. Uh, second, evaluate and improve the financials of the business so you can maximize, maximize valuation. Third, consider the type of buyers, the point that you just made, insiders, strategic buyer from the outside, or employees. And then finally, the structure of the deal, the financial side of the deal. Where is the money coming from, that sort of thing. So let's just go ahead and, and jump into assembling the team. Because it's really important to have a great team. Uh, in your experience, Ben, who should be on the team? I think it's always important to bring in some of the trusted advisors that um, the business owner is working with on a you know monthly, quarterly, yearly basis. So the, the top two that come to mind is, certainly for contractors, is the CPA and the bonding agent. And so I think really getting them into the deal, getting them you know kind of familiar with what the, the goals of the owner are, and ultimately what um, seems to be the best route of exit based on the company's cash flow, it's really important to get them in. Um, mm. and, and I think another thing that could be um, important is depending on if you're trying to um, find a, a buyer, because you don't, you don't have one, would be a, a business broker in, in that industry that specializes specific to the industry that your client is in. You really want to um, help kind of drive more potential options to the deal. I think um, in my experience all of that is true and more. I found that sometimes bringing their uh, law firm in early for um, uh, documentation uh, uh, in input on how you might um, structure it and what kind of documents you're going to need. Um, those longtime advisors know where all the bodies are buried, don't they? They know uh, the good, bad, and the ugly of the company and the more you know up front uh, the smoother the, the transaction occurs. There's no surprises, right, um, in, that, uh, in that process. Um, you know, getting all these people together, I mean, contractors and business owners are busy, busy people. And so getting all these people together and coordinating their efforts is, uh, is important. So who takes that role? Well, uh, often that I find that that's where we get in, is to be that plan quarterback, you know, so the exit planning quarterback that really has an area of expertise and knowledge in multiple disciplines um, so that we can talk, you know, the, the same language as the attorney. We can talk the same language as the accountant and be able to help communicate kind of the important highlights to the client so uh, progress can continue to be made. I mean, you know, you see so many deals that just get stuck somewhere and they fizzle out and die and um, what do they say time kills deals and so you want to keep a certain cadence and uh, momentum to deals and that's ultimately where 
uh, having you know an exit planning quarterback can be very very valuable so the business owner has a primary contact the quarterback you and then you assemble the team and you help keep everyone accountable and on task uh, with deadlines and that sort of thing um, so it sounds very very efficient um, and it keeps um, the momentum going in the transaction like you said instead of getting stuck yep I think um, probably uh, another part of that as the quarterback is to really understand the goals of the client. What are they trying to achieve? When do they want to exit? Um, you mentioned earlier in the opening about valuation, what they need to get from the business. But I think the quarterback, is, is an important role is really understand what the client is trying to accomplish uh, right off the bat, right up front. Yeah, and I think another thing that comes to mind is being there to assure the client that if this is the structure of the deal, as you're getting close to the one yard line, that this is what the net is going to be and this is ultimately the experience, but being that second um, pair of eyes to say, hey, this is going to be a good deal for you. You're, you're happily ever after is going to work. That's great. Now, I know a part uh, of the process is um, the client having uh, good planning in place and oftentimes I think when we meet with clients and talk about exit you ask them when do you want to exit and they say well yesterday right <laughs> and uh, the optimal time really is three to five years before a transaction isn't it so that you can prepare properly uh, and get people ready uh, for the transaction I think another role that quarterbacks do is we, we have to give them bad news we have to give a, a client some news maybe they don't want to hear maybe the valuation of the company isn't as high as they thought um, and we have to break that news to them and, uh, and help them improve value uh, over the next three to five years. And that's where time can be really helpful. I've found that some of our most successful exits have been uh, started pre-planning 10 years out. Mm -hmm. And so it just really depends on what the strategy is assumed to be, but time on your side is always very, very beneficial. So you and I were talking earlier off camera about how important uh, a business owner's personal planning is. So oftentimes you, you undertake a personal financial planning process so that they really get their arms around their, their personal financial situation and what their needs are and that sort of thing. Is that true? That is true. Yeah. And I, I found with contractors, they tend to be do-it-yourselfers. They don't have a ton of liquidity. So the big you know, money managers aren't really approaching them because there's not a lot of assets to manage. So we become that financial planner for them as well that's really sorting through the, you know, creating the map on their personal financial plan. We call it an exit readiness analysis and then helping that be combined with the exit plan to get them across the finish line so they have a good um, you know, outcome. Yeah, I think the reality is, is that business owners, um, closely held business owners, especially their personal and their business finances are so combined or overlapped in many instances that by doing a personal financial plan you're able to sort of unwind them a little bit and take a look at business finances separate from personal finances yeah which um, brings us to step two which is to help them hopefully improve uh, the valuation of what they ultimately receive for their life's work um, so talk about that process a little bit. Yeah, I think you want to look at P&L and balance sheets, usually going back five years. Um, but you have the, the devil's in the details. You have to really kind of get into certain line items and understanding, OK, well, are there personal expenses that you're running through the company? Um, you know, who, who owns your car, the company or yourself? Um, other things can be, uh, you know, will flow through entities like S-Corps or LLCs. Usually their, their you know, tax planner is saying, hey, let's try to whittle down the profit so we're not showing as much, so we're not getting hammered in taxes. But that can work contrary to looking really good on paper to position yourself to uh, a third party buyer, where on an insider, they're more inclined to gloss over some of those details because they understand that things are running through the company. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're, they're more apt to give a higher valuation or agree to a higher valuation because they see the way the owner's living. And they right. anticipate that, hey, I'm going to go from making employee money to making owner money. And so a lot of times insiders are the best uh, buyers. 
So their CPA, this is where their CPA might come in and help with their expertise and say, look, we want to go back three years minimally and restate the financials, normalizing them um, uh, so that if an outsider looked at these financials, um, they would be appropriate. And yeah. I think that's an eye-opening experience for a lot of business owners who have treated their business like a personal checkbook. Yeah. You know, I'd, working with a client right now, um, having got through COVID, um, and right before COVID, they had an offer on their company for $12 million bucks. And this is not a contractor. This is a, a distributor. Um, and then we get to the other side of COVID. The buyer comes back to the table and says, hey, I'll, I'll honor that still or that same purchase price. But the client said, OK, well, we have a little more time on our side. Let's make sure we get our financials right. The accountant who I was talking to said, hey, you know, we should probably do some work on, you know, straightening things out, brought in a mergers and acquisitions firm. They came in and made a lot of sense of some of the financials. Now, uh, the valuation isn't 12 million, it's 32 million. Just, that that's a big difference. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a good phone call to make. Yeah. You know, um, when you look at the uh, financials, you really get into them and normalize them, as I said. A couple things come out, I think, uh, as well, uh, that decrease value. The one that comes to mind, I think, is concentration of uh, customer base, where someone might have 70% of the revenue coming from one customer, um, one source, if you will, and that creates uh, risk for the buyer and decreases value. And so um, they may work, for example, for the, in the next three to five years before exit to diversify their customer base so that they can reduce that, that risk and improve the value. Yeah. You know, sometimes you'll see um, employees of a large company carve out a niche that they can own their own business by providing a service to that large company. And so they, they, they you know, leave that company, become a contractor, start their own business, but then their one client is their past employer. And so that's what you're saying is there's tremendous co concentration risk on their client base. And you know, if they're forward leaning and, and trying to grow, they will expand. But sometimes a lot of small companies just get content on making the money they're making. It's a lifestyle company. They have you know, one to five clients high concentration risk, but you know, I've seen that hurt some uh, small businesses in the past. You're going to live and die by that one customer. You could get legislated out of business tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, or a contract gets cut. Um, you know, having the CPA and the quarterback do some work on the P&L and the financials is certainly a way to go, but another way to go is to spend a little bit more money and, and hire um, someone that does uh, valuations, company valuations. Um, when do you find that that's necessary? Is there a, a point in time where you bring a, a, a paid valuator in? Um, tell me about your experience there. Yeah, so again, just depends on the buyer, depends on the purpose. So um, a lot of times when you have uh, an owner who's selling to an insider, they, they just can very commonly come to an agreement on the price. Um, you know, kind of get a ballpark valuation done um, and then just kind of tighten it up between the two of them. However, sometimes they just need to have an independent third party come in who's a professional and deliver, you know, kind of their expert number based on industry multiples and what the financials say. Um, so it really just depends on the situation. Uh, then you have family businesses. So family businesses, if we're doing something for estate tax purposes, you're going to need a formal valuation to be done. However, the valuation expert has a, has a different purpose than maximizing value. Yes. They're trying to minimize value a lot of times to get certain parts of that equity over the tax fence. So good all point. Depends. Really, really good point. Um, after you get a valuation, you get your arms around the range of value, probably is more appropriate rather than a number, a range of value. The next step is to, is to really talk about who's a potential buyer. And um, there are three, right? There are um, insiders or employees uh, of the company. We have a strategic outside buyer to be brought to the table by, let's say, a, a, a mergers and acquisitions firm, for example, or, or a business broker. 
And the third is um, employees buy it. All of them may be vis-a-vis -a -vis a, uh, an ESOP transaction, something to, like that. Um, how do you have that conversation? And, and what, what, I guess, guides a business owner to one versus the other? Yeah, so let's just go from the back to the front. And the last thing you touched on is the concept of, of an ESOP, where you're selling the company to all of the employees. And usually that's, it's uh, necessary or best with a bigger company um, because the valuation is too high for any employee with minimal assets to get a loan to buy out you know, the, the stock. So bigger companies tend to be better candidates. Uh, they have to have a certain you know, type of cash flow as well for it to make sense. However, with some of those big companies, depending on the size, selling to everyone via ESOP can be a problem because some of the key people who have been loyal and have been kind of waiting for their turn to carry the torch, they don't want to be equal owners or you know, minority shareholders with the whole, all 300, all 1,000 employees. They want it to be similar to the owner, you know, and having just a small pool of uh, shareholders. So it can be very delicate, the conversations in those scenarios take some, some finesse. Mm -hmm. um, so the second thing you touched on is having a strategic buyer and whether it's a competitor or whether it's a you know, complementary business in an industry, I think having a professional like a, um, a business broker or um, you know, bringing in a mergers and acquisitions expert to kind of help structure that deal or evaluate that deal is, is usually best in those scenarios. And then what um, my team and I do a lot of is the internal buyouts. Those are a lot easier to facilitate um, and the buyer is, especially with contractors, private equity firms don't wanna buy contractors, just too volatile of industry. And so most of the sales between con or for contractors are just having a you know, handful or less of employees who wanna go from making employee money to making owner money. Um, I like everything you said. I'm gonna add some of my own um, experience to it. And so I'll take the first one, which was the ESOP. And I've been involved in over my 35 year career, dozens of ESOP transactions. And when valuations are high like they are right now, lots of people talking about ESOP transactions because they're tax advantage for the owners. Um, they can be leveraged, a bank, you can have financing involved and they're very sexy. Yeah. It's a very sexy uh, uh, and very tax efficient approach. Um, but a lot of them stumble, they don't go. And I think um, in my experience, the reason they don't go is the culture of the company and of the owners. Because I have found that if, if the client is only tax motivated, that is their pure 100% motivation for that approach, um, then I believe that it, it, it's not likely to, to be a positive outcome. I think in my experience, the ones that have worked well uh, have a, uh, uh, the owners have a bit of an altruistic uh, feeling about their company and the continuation of their company and taking care of employees and passing it on to employees. Um, so there's that, that, that fit from, uh, uh, from a cultured perspective. Yeah. And if without that, I, I find that, I guess, you know, you just really don't have um, the base in which to work from. I think the second thing is, um, uh, is the cost of an ESOP transaction. They're, very, they're expensive. I think um, a lot of clients go down the road with an ESOP expert and then they, they get a feasibility study done and then they see the cost of it and they're wow. So I think knowing what that's gonna be up front to avoid sticker shock is, a, is, is positive so that you can weigh the, you know, the cost and benefits. Um, strategic buyers, you know, uh, sometimes when you have great stock market uh, roaring and there's a lot of roll-ups happening, um, uh, there are cases where paving contractors, very large uh, contractors are rolled up, um, but those are very rare, right? And, and uh, so to your point, I think that the, the, mo the most common uh, uh, design is with insiders. And of course, insiders, the problem right off the bat is they have no money, yeah. okay? And we don't know whether they're entrepreneurial or not. Or not. Um, and all of, and they're gonna have their own set of advisors with their own opinions. So I think that um, the quarterback, um, 
the earlier they can have conversations, if they're going to go down that path with the potential buyers, the insiders, maybe uh, the top five people of the company together will purchase the company. So you can interview them and understand uh, what those employees, key employees' goals are long term. Do they have the stomach for the risk that's involved in entrepreneurial endeavors? Uh, especially in the contracting world because you have a lot of risk yeah. and there's there's always the issue of, of uh, bonding and um, licensing that you have to deal with. So um, I think that uh, insider is a challenge of no money and, um, and tre really trying to find out who has an entrepreneurial spirit and who doesn't when it gets right down to it. I've had an experience where you've had five key employees, you get all the way down to closing and then one had, you know, cold feet, and they, they back out. And uh, so the, the sooner you, you know who is in and who is out, I think the better. It's a very emotional process. Um, and so that's been my experience uh, on, those, uh, on those three. Um, demographics right now, as you know, I mean, it's the aging of America. Um, and so uh, business owners are exiting, um, you know, daily. Um, and so, uh, I think that this uh, area of specialty is just going to be um, increasing over the next 10, 20 years for sure as, as, these, as people exit. The final step is structuring the deal. Um, and I, why don't I just, what comes to mind when, it come, when, when I talk to you about structuring the deal? Well, I think one that a lot of owners don't realize the difference between an asset sale and a stock sale. And so when you put that on paper and understand that an asset sale is going to be taxed differently than a stock sale and you model those out, you know, with uh, financial modeling, um, that's something that needs to be negotiated because if the goal is to have, you know, a, a certain net number, but you are anticipating it's going to be a stock sale, but the buyer at the last or the seller, excuse me, at the um, now the buyer at the last minute says, hey, no, we want to do uh, an asset purchase. Well, mm. now that just changed the deal. So you got to put a premium on the deal so you still net the um, rightful number that you deserve. I think uh, asset sales are more common because buyers don't want to assume the risks, known and unknown. The liability is known and unknown for that entity. So they're not going to buy the stock. They're going to want to buy the assets. Um, at least that's my experience. Um, from a financing perspective, um, we, I, I mentioned a bit ago that insiders have no money, so you have to find the money. You have to be creative with the money. An ESOP transaction, um, the earnings of the company and the cash flows of the company are, are, are buying out the owners over time, but on insiders, we have to find a way to, to help them purchase it. Um, how have you structured insider sales um, in the past? Yeah, so sometimes what we'll do to make the, um, the math make sense for the company is we'll devalue the stock and we'll add some type of compensation plan for the departing owner for a period of time. So that's going to be taxable income to them. The devaluing of the stock is going to be, or the stock itself is going to be capital gains tax, but we'll model those numbers and make them work so that the, the departing owner is still getting a comparable net number. For insiders especially, double taxation is really the problem, right? Because if I'm going to, you're exiting, I own the company now, I have to take after-tax dollars, pay you, and then you're going to pay tax on those dollars again. Yeah. So I think what you're saying is, I like what you say, you devalue, is that you try to move as much of the purchase price into single tax dollars or deductible dollars. So things like leases, the building might be owned by the, uh, um, by the current owner, so yeah. you increase rents to the highest uh, defensible amount. Um, you go back into a compensation study and you book deferred compensation, which is deductible to the entity, um, paid out. Um, other perks, you know, post-retirement, uh, you add on as well. And so the total package, I think, is the, is the same dollar amount, the cash flow, the, the uh, departing owner is going to get the same bucket of money, they're just going to get it in different sources, and hopefully um, most of it single taxed, not double taxed. Yeah, that's a great point, Mark. That, that's exactly right. Sometimes we'll even um, 
add a layer or try to leverage the company uh, sponsored retirement plan to some degree, whether it's the 401k with profit sharing dollars or even you know putting a pension plan in place on top of that to help the owner get some extra dollars um, you know that are not going to be taxed twice. That's a great, I, I remember myself doing that with a defined benefit plan, which allows for very large contributions. Owner was going to stay on another three, four, five years, put a bunch of money in there. Plus with a contractor, liability and um, liability protection um, from lawsuits is huge. And dollars in those plans are, at least in California, are creditor proof. So that's a good place to, uh, uh, to put that, uh, that money. Um, I, I mentioned uh, a bit ago about cold feet and, and insiders talking to everyone. And so I think as a quarterback, uh, it's, it's, it's our job to talk to that client and prepare them for what is going to come. And what, and what I mean by that is you have five you know, key people that are buying and we interview them and they're all excited about it and I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And then they talk to everybody, right? They talk to their wife, they talk to their father, they talk to their father-in-law, they talk to the guy that washes their car and, and <laughs> everything. And the next thing you know, um, you know, they're pushing back on everything. So I think that there is a, uh, a process that you have to go to and an expectation. Uh, and I try, to, I try to make sure that the, the client is very aware that this is likely. And if it doesn't happen at the beginning, it's going to happen at the end. Um, so it, 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 it's, uh, it's just a part of it. You've got to go through it. Again, insiders that have never owned a company, this is potentially the biggest purchase outside of a real estate purchase they would ever make. And so they're rightfully, appropriately um, uh, asking a lot of questions and, uh, you know, and uh, risk averse. Um, I like the idea of um, on an uh, insider sale, um, uh, the idea, especially if it's family, partly family-owned, uh, the idea of gifting. Have you ever used gifting, um, gifting of stock to, to um, uh, active children in the business as a way to help transfer? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there needs to be um, a fair amount of communication that goes with that because the term gift is received differently than uh, hey, I'm buying or we're selling. And when you deal with families where you have multiple kids, not all of them in the business, and you're using a gifting strategy is their you know, advisor, and then that same gifting term is being used at the dinner table you know, for, for Christmas with the entire family. You know, some outside the company children are saying, oh, you just gave the company to little Johnny. And it's like, no. That it's it's a term, but actually it's being bought, and here's how the cash flow works. Um, so yeah, you know, using a gift for uh, family transactions is can be very um, good to leverage. However, I think communication is very key. I, I find that in this stage is when you bring in the law firm, because um, you need to put the deal points together. You need to have a term sheet at some point that you share that is agreed upon between buyer and seller. And things like, like liability protection and uh, licensing, bonding, uh, potential uh, banking covenants that have to be reviewed, all of that uh, is in the world of not only the bonding agent, but the, um, um, but the lawyer that specializes in drafting these types of documents for that industry, for that industry. Um, uh, I've had, um, um, well, I'll just say this. I would say that, that the, the, the sooner in the deal um, making stage you can get that lawyer involved, the better, because they bring up issues that no one's thought of. And uh, again, nobody likes surprises, so I think the earlier the better you can deal with it. Uh, you don't want to have the day before closing day something come up and, and upset the apple cart. So I really like uh, uh, to do it up front. Yeah, I agree. And that's where I think uh, it just gets back to, you know, more of the valuable advisors at the table and more communication. Um, why don't, you know, I thought we would um, uh, end this uh, show today with you sharing or maybe both of us sharing some, some real success stories. 
and maybe one or two pitfalls that you absolutely want to avoid. So your choice, you can start with the pitfalls or you can, or you, or you can start with the great success stories. Well, Mark, I, I really like that you brought about that really figuring out when it comes to an inside um, transaction between an owner selling to a group of employees that you have to figure out if those employees are really entrepreneurs or not. If they're not entrepreneurs, the chances of the deal actually working, it's, it's certainly less. And so I think on the front side, the owner can do a great job of discipling or mentoring those employees to help develop that ownership mentality and that entrepreneurial mindset in them. And if that's done correctly, I find the deals work a lot better because there is a willingness to take on some risk because they realize that risk is being borne for decades, you know, and, and for any other contractor, or any other business owner or competitor of the company, that there is always inherent risk in life. We drive the freeways and there's risk in that. So I think really helping understand um, if that employee is, a, is an entrepreneur is really, really key. And so that there was a situation, it was a contractor, and um, I actually had introduced them to this uh, uh, project manager for another company who really had a heart to be an owner. And the succession plan of his current employer um, was just got inked and he wasn't part of it. So he you know, started to look around for other opportunities, um, connected with this contractor and they really hit it off. And uh, sure enough, he jumped ship, went over and then they started to prepare the plans. They hired me and the team to build their succession plan. And um, I took for granted that there, there's communication and there's a process and there's questions that I should have asked that I have asked in the past about you know, whether that person's really an entrepreneur or not. And we got to the one yard line and um, a month before that one yard line, I started to see just a, a change in kind of uh, the chemistry between the buyer and the, and the seller. And um, we get to that one yard line and I had a very difficult conversation with the buyer, the, the employee. And at the end of the day, his communication to me was pretty much, I'm just not willing to take on this risk. And that was, that was uh, developed because he had bought his first house in 2007 when you know housing prices were bananas. Everybody's buying a house with no money down and then he lost his house. Um, yeah. and, and so that risk really hurt him for, you know, for taking another chance at, um, you know, uh, buying something. And, um, so that deal fell through and it was tough because I really thought the chemistry between, t uh, you know, those parties was, was great. And I thought it was going to work out and it didn't. And I, I took that one hard because as a competitor, um, I like to you know, make deals happen and, and make marriages happen, mm. but that one didn't. And so that was one that went wrong. I know I asked you for a success story, but I'm gonna have you wait a moment because I, you stole my thunder <laughs> because my horror story mirrors yours. Um, and this is a, also a contractor with a long-term employee, a younger man, uh, met him, interviewed him. He was very excited, married, I think one child. Um, just thrilled at the opportunity. The client uh, slowly brought him in and mentored him as we put the deal together. He had outside valuation done. We had some missteps because this particular uh, key employee started to talk to a lot of other people and bring other people into the process and we were able to get by that. But at the end of the day, the, the insider wanted a discount on the price that was just unreasonable, unreasonable. And they could not come together. And, I, and, I, and I'm, <laughs> it's horrible to say, but true, um, the business owner ended up letting that, that uh, key person go and uh -oh. actively looking for a replacement. And this, we didn't bring this point up, but if you don't have the right horses and you want to do an insider, you have to go find them. You have to locate them, recruit them, and bring them in and mentor them so that they'll be ready to, uh, to buy your business. So I, similar outcome, heartbreaking for everyone. Um, uh, uh, 
wonderful business. The, the, the young man is a wonderful young man. I wish him well. Uh, just, it just, I wish we had known that in, in up front, but I don't, I, I think that he was, you know, we were all in the spirit of cooperation and honesty, but I think as they got closer and closer, he got more and more nervous, just like your client. Um, what about a success story? Let's end on a success story. Yeah, so success story, uh, you know, I'm not from here, so when I started in this business, I had to cold call, which is not very fun, but uh, I came across uh, a small business down in, in San Diego, and um, it, was, uh, it was a family that had, you know, originally three kids in the business. Unfortunately, the older child had uh, passed away, and, and he was the, the MVP of the team. He was running the show. But then when he passed away, it caused the parents to kind of s take a step back and say, okay, well, wh what, are, what are we doing here? And they got back in the cockpit and started driving things. But, you know, as, as it happens, uh, one of the younger children just stepped up and went into that role where the older brother was and just really started to run the company, learn things really quickly. And so when I got to the table, it was it just right after that tragedy. And so they, they clearly needed a quarterback. And so I came back in, put things, or came in, put things together for them. You know, not just from a, a financial planning perspective and a, you know, positioning for the exit plan, but this, this family estate had grown to where they had significant estate tax um, exposure. So we started to do some planning there. Um, and the, the younger child, which was the, the um, you know, developed a real a player all-star mentality and they started running the company started growing it the other child kind of got lockstep with the sibling and they just really started to um, have that company take off and so right before um the the valuation would have increased increased we got a low valuation gifted most of the stock to the two uh, children from the uh, parents and within uh, five years from that time, unfortunately, the, the father had passed away. And um, one of the, um, the challenges that was thought to be a challenge was that with the father was not around, that some of those relationships that really drove the revenue of the business were gonna be compromised, and they weren't. They just continued to do business with the children as if the father was still around. And eventually, uh, three years after that, they sold for a very large multiple, and now um, you know that family yeah. is is in the in the sunset, you know, enjoying things. That's a great success story. I'll end I'll end with my show, so I'll end with mine. Um, mine too also is uh, is a family uh, where we have uh, one active uh, ch uh, child, and the other children are not active in the business. So the very successful business started uh, by father and, and other family members and dividends coming off very significant to the non-working uh, children. And um, I think one of the things in, in a family situation where you have um, uh, you know, the, 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 the founder of the company oftentimes is what I call a maverick. They're just, or that these people are you know, they start this thing from scratch and they just grow it and it's just, they're, they're a maverick. And, um, and that generation, I'm talking about people in their 70s and 80s, don't normally share uh, financial information, estate planning information with their children. That generation, there's some lack of communication. So I'll ask the second generation, but working in the company or not, what's gonna happen? They have no clue. And so, what I'm uh, proud about, uh, what occurred, is communication began between all those family members. I called family meetings, and the, the agendas, both spoken and unspoken, were allowed to come out. And then we were able to um, uh, uh, sell the company uh, to a strategic buyer, an outsider. Everybody got paid, um, and the family is as tight as ever. Um, because certainly you don't want that to split anybody up. But I think it was early on um, helping with communication, helping the family communicate and talk about things that they were uncomfortable talking about. And so that, that's a really great success story. Uh, and we'll leave it at that. You know, Mark, you touched on a great point. I think that was one of the things that separates um, FDP and the way you do things from other firms is 
uh, being able to facilitate and run a successful family meeting. That's really important, really, really important for a financial planner to be able to um, successfully conduct. And I, I know that you guys have a great reputation of doing that. Well, you are a fantastic partner coming on. I'm, I'm pleased to know you. And uh, thank you for doing this and sharing your uh, expertise and your wisdom today, Ben. My pleasure. Here. That's all the time for today. I want to thank you for listening to the FDP Prosperity Report. We'll see you next time. You've invested years into building your business. Have you thought about what will eventually happen if you chose to ease up, retire completely, or sell or transfer it to someone else? You want to make sure you get maximum value for all you've created. That's why I want to offer you our free online exit preparedness assessment. Our 18-point evaluation helps you assess your readiness, including owner objectives, ownership transfers, business continuity, and maximizing business value. It only takes five minutes and we'll email you a report that evaluates your answers and offers you ideas about how you can move forward. There's no cost and no obligation. Just go to fdpwm.com and look for our exit strategies page. When done right, a sale or transfer can take years of preparation. So get your assessment today.